Okay, good morning. How are we doing today? Everybody doing good? Everybody got lunch plans? Anybody, anybody looking for lunch plans? Clyde and Jan said they'll take whoever out to eat today at Sugar Bear. So just meet up with them out, outside. Uh, it's so good to have you with us today. It is, an, I, I hope you understand this, an incredible privilege and honor that we have to get together on this street corner and be all about Jesus and not have to worry about our, our freedom, our safety. It, it's just amazing. Now, on top of that, God's like giving this air-conditioned building and all these kind of things. He's just so good. And he's, he's, he's deserving of our attention, our worship, our praise, our fellowship. So it's good to be together here today. Um, some announcements I need to make, if I can, please. Uh, one, Dwayne is on vacation. Um, I think they went to the mountains this go around. And uh, Reverend Jesse Peavy, where is Jesse? <laughs> is filling in for him today. And that's an exciting thing. I'm glad to have Jesse up here the, leading us in worship along with his choir. Um, okay, so a lot of things are going on today that we can't see, maybe. Uh, one, we have a lot of our high school students who are at camp. They took off last week. They'll be back uh, tomorrow. They get back tomorrow or Tuesday? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. And uh, so far, so good. We haven't lost any of them. And um, so we still have the same number coming back. Be in prayer for them. Our Uganda team, they're starting to wind up their trip. They'll be coming back in the middle of this week. Pray for their safety. That's a long plane ride from Uganda uh, back up here. Uh, they've dealt with some adversity on, in the course of this trip, getting down there. Um, there was a death in the family of one of the people that they're down there to help. It's just been a lot of things going on, but uh, they've worked through it, and they'll get home. On Thursday of this week at 12 o'clock noon in the fellowship hall, our Legacy Builders Luncheon. And that's a great time of food and a great time of fellowship. Uh, those of you who come, if you'll, if you'll bring whatever side dishes and or desserts you want to bring. I checked with Clyde just before. He said the church is going to provide the pickled pig's feet. And, um, <laughs> and we just need the size to go with it. So that's at 12 o'clock. And you know what? This is for our legacy builders. And uh, to qualify for legacy builders, what, what do you, what's the qualifications? <laughs> On Thursday, it's hungry. Oh, on up to it. On up to it. Sorry. On up to it. Yeah, there you go. Jesse got it. You're, you are certified to come if you know what pickled pig's feet are. Okay, so if, you, if you're going like, ooh, no, I hated those, you need to probably be here. Um, anyway, so that's coming up uh, on Thursday. We also have this week... Um, Several from our fellowship that will be traveling to Texas. Some will be going by airplane. Some will be driving out there. And that's for the National Bible Drill Tournament. We have two of ours who will be competing. Uh, they were state champions. Now they're going out there to compete at the national tournament. And uh, people are going on. So we'll be praying for them as they uh, compete out there. And also for traveling uh, safety for all of those going. So. Those things being said, let me touch base. This is uh, the week of our first FCA outreach event out here in the parking lot. This is, um, would be year number four if we hadn't had to take last year off. Uh, there will be about 500 high school football players from six different schools gathered in our parking lot uh, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, they're here for a two-day football camp. Uh, they'll come in Wednesday. They'll have seven-on-seven uh, -seven drills. Uh, they'll go shower, they'll come here, we're going to feed them pizza, we're going to feed them cookies, and Jan tells me we have all the cookies we need. 1,500 cookies, bagged up already, or will be bagged up. And water, they'll be coming in, um, a ministry, a group called J.J. Weeks Band, I don't know if you've ever heard of J.J. Weeks, they'll be here leading worship uh, as a part of that event, and we'll be sharing the gospel. Just really, it's an incredible opportunity that God just kind of sits in our laps, not a fundraiser. Some people have asked me this week as they heard about J.J. Weeks leading this, they said, why haven't y'all been advertising that? Well, like, because this isn't a concert. It's us, you know, this is a, a, a very closed type thing uh, with our focus really on those football players. 
So that's Wednesday. There won't be any other, any other kind of activities going on here. But all day long Wednesday, there will be stuff happening. So let me just say these, go through them really fast. If you have volunteered, and let me just say, that's crazy. We sent out, these are the things we need, and it's all been covered. All across the board, generators, swimming pool, pop-up tents, cookies, whatever it might be. But if, you, if you're one of those who said, hey, I have a generator, I have a pop-up tent, I have a kiddie pool, whatever it might be, uh, that I'd be glad for y'all to use. Need you to have those here by four o'clock on Tuesday. The office closes at four. You can bring it uh, Monday, anytime Monday, anytime during the day, Tuesday. We just need them here because at eight o'clock on Wednesday morning, if you don't have anything to do and you want to come out here and get a little workout in, we're going to be setting up about 500 chairs, unloading them off the, uh, uh, out of the trailer and then setting those up. We're going to be setting up the greeting stations, uh, the fans, getting the generators, you know, pretty much set up the whole thing. And uh, how long it'll take has a lot to do with who's able to show up. And that's for anybody, male, female, adult, student, bring them, everybody can take a chair and unfold it. And we're gonna get, we're, uh, Jennifer's already been working, we've got it kind of, how we're gonna grid it out and, and where it'll be set up. So that starts out at 8 a.m. And then those of you who will actually be working um, the event, I, I don't know that's the right way to put that, ministering at the event. Uh, you need to be here by 6 o'clock p.m. if at all possible. The service starts at 7, and so all of our men and young men and students who are coming, remember, Wednesday night at the actual event, men only, young boys only, no females. And um, that's just to remove some distractions that we kind of figured out we were having there in the last couple of years. Now, if you're, uh, I know I had one mama came up and her, her uh, student age daughter was not real, real happy about that and um, because they just like to serve. Uh, if you want to hang around, uh, do whatever you do at home, and then about 8.30, you're like, let's just go up there and help them break down. Come on up. Be glad to have you uh, because that'll be taking place immediately after the service. Be breaking down all those chairs, putting them back in the trailers, moving all the fans inside and all that kind of stuff. So there you go. It's a busy, busy day, an incredible day of opportunity, and, and, and basically our role is to roll up our sleeves and to be here to serve and, uh, and trust the seeds of the gospel that are going out. And then we'll do it all again in July. Now, in July, there's going to be about 1,100 football players here, uh, about twice the size of this first one. Thir uh, I don't think, Jen where's Jennifer? She was here. How, was it 11 schools, 13 schools that second one? Did we get that list yet? 12, 12 schools, different high schools be bringing their football teams. And these are some big schools with uh, a lot of, well, we have a couple that have like 100 players uh, that'll be coming. So we'll be doing all this again, except we're gonna have to have more cookies. <laughs> about twice as many, but Miss Deanna will be letting you know about that. Okay, so it's gonna be fun. It's great that you're here. Um, I'm gonna say this now, uh, and then I hope you'll practice it uh, as we leave. But if you look around as we're worshiping, singing, whatever, if you see a face you don't recognize, go meet that person. Introduce yourself and, um, and make a new friend, okay? Let's pray together. Father, we love you today. We thank you for the chance to be here, to give our heart, our mind, our bodies uh, to this moment in worship. Now, there's, there's a lot of stuff that crowds into our brains and crowds into our hearts and distracts us. And Father, we, we just we want to be honest about that and ask you to quiet our hearts and minds by the presence of your Holy Spirit and, and help us here in these minutes to just really soak up your presence and, and let you speak to us through music and through Bible study and fellowship and prayer. We love you today and we thank you for Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Jesse, come lead us. Man. Thank you. If you'll please stand as we will sing our first song, which will be Who Can Satisfy My Soul? Please stand as we sing this.
Thank you. You may be seated. The most repeated question by Jesus during his ministry was this. Have you never read? Have you never read? Underneath that simple question is a life-altering implication. You should read the Word of God. That's why Jesus also says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Jesus knows that there is a spiritual hunger inside of every human heart that can only be satisfied by consuming the words of God. Christian, give yourself to the Word of God. The Word of God is a rock, strong and steady. It doesn't budge, break, or crumble under pressure. It's an anchor in the storm, keeping us calm when everything around us is chaotic. The Word of God is a mirror showing us who we really are. You don't just read the Word of God, it reads you. It's a treasure, beautiful in every dimension and worth every effort of discovery. It brings endless joy and eternal riches to all who find it. It's a fire spreading across the world to bring heat and life. It's a river bringing life and power to everything it touches. The Word of God is a seed planted deep inside of our hearts, producing the fruit of holiness and righteousness. The Word of God is a sword, dividing true and false, right and wrong, good and evil. It's a hammer, crushing what needs to be crushed and breaking what needs to be broken. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to show us our path. So let the voice of God be the first the last and the loudest voice in your ear today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life. Give yourself to the Word of God. The Word of God, the Word of God. Uh, Dwayne mentioned last Sunday, do you remember the choir special? Does anybody remember the choir special? What was the name of it? I know they do. I think they do. Psalms 23, because we're looking at doing uh, singing from Scripture. It kind of follows that really well, you know. And so we're singing from Scripture. And very easily, last song, uh, Sunday, the song was entitled Psalms 23. And it's uh, put playing straight forward. Well, today is coming from the New Testament, and it's in Philippians. And I'm going to read that. It's Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And this is the words. And you'll hear these words in the song, and you'll see them on the screen also. This is from the New King James Version. And it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in, in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and being, became obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, what will happen? Every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Please join us as we worship together as the choir sings at the name of Jesus.
our favorites. And it, and it, it preaches the word and it has that scripture. So thank you, choir, for that. Please join us to us, join our next hymns as we stand and we sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And we'll close with that with Jesus loves me. Please stand as we sing this hymn. <laughs> It is a name I love to hear, I love to sing His word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Jesse. Kind of like traveling back in time singing those last couple of songs there. A lot of fun. Just can kind of let it fly. So um, let's have a, a word of prayer together before we uh, get into God's word. Um, let me ask you to continue to pray for Miss Lunell Watson. Uh, her husband, Bob, graduated. He's home. He's with his father in heaven. And Ms. Lunell will now start a new part of her journey here on this earth. So let's pray for her and, uh, and uh, their, their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Uh, any other, any other uh, prayer need you just want to call out? You don't have to explain. You can just call out a name. Jane Sumner. Jane Sumner. Shanna Evans. Pastor Keith. <laughs> Misty Stanfield. 
He's a mollus. Jewel Turnell, and you said? Okay, Pete Cobb. You got the mission team, their journey home, our students, as they finish up today and tomorrow morning, and then they head back. The FCA, FCA event Wednesday night, I hope you're already praying for that. Let's continue to. Somebody said something? Nancy Parker. Nancy Parker, okay. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have plenty of prayer requests, but you're just not going to call them out right in here? Just raise your hand. We'll call them unspoken requests. Yeah, a lot going on. Let's pray together. Father, we bow before you. And God, sometimes we're so eager to jump in uh, to tell you everything that needs doing and uh, who needs help. And, and Father, we, we forget that you already know all this. We don't have to update you. We don't have to... Um, remind you. We don't have to inform you. Father, we bring these things to you in prayer because one, we just want to ask that, that, that you work in a powerful way and that, that Jesus gets all the credit. And Father, we want, to, we want to offer ourselves, our hands, our feet, our, our, our mouth to be the instrument of your encouragement, of your provision and the lives of people to help meet the needs of those who maybe are dealing with difficult things. Father, I, my, my prayer as we remember those who are dealing with difficult things in their life is that, that Father, a lot of the time you use us as your hands and feet. And so we offer ourselves to you for that. And now, Father, as we uh, talk about uh, walking with you and, and what your Bible teaches us, we need your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and to speak truth in our hearts. And so we give ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, you know, sometimes, I don't know how many people in here have ever played any kind of uh, sport at all, especially, you know, whether it's a team sport or we had a coach or whatever it might be. I have, I have, this is a vivid memory, although I don't exactly remember. I think it was seventh grade at what was then called uh, Glen County Junior High School. Uh, that was back in the day of junior high. How many of you remember junior high school? And, uh, and then you went to senior high school. And so anyway, um, I was, um, had gone out for the basketball team at the junior high school, junior high basketball team. And I, th I think this is when it was. It might have been a little bit earlier in rec ball, but I have, for some reason I, I think not. But I can remember, I can remember vividly that one of the first practices we were having, the coach, coach was just trying to, you know, instill some basic things. And, and so he started talking to us about zone defenses in basketball. If you've ever played basketball, you know what a zone defense is. And so he's out there and he's throwing things out. He said, okay, you know, you got, you got your basic 2-1-2 two, two, and you got a 2-3 and sometimes I want to go with a, uh, a boxing one. And, and so and all this stuff out there. And I, I didn't have a lot of basketball experience, and I'm like, I don't, I'm cl I don't have a clue what he's talking about. And so he was kind of positioning us, you know, he'd bring a group of five out and position us and, 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 and give us a big overview, okay? You know, right here, if we're playing a 2-1-2, two, two, okay, guards out front. And I was always out front, I was a guard. You know, owing to my incredible height, they always put me at the guard position. And, um, but I was quick. And, and, and so, okay, this is why when the ball's coming over to the wing, this is the flow when it's coming back, and this is the flow and all this, and you got to collapse and going through all this stuff. And, and he didn't even mention the part about how you had to do it really fast. The way he was explaining it, it sounded like he just kind of kind of had to, you know, float over here and then float over here. And I didn't realize you had to run sprints, you know, from depending on where the ball was, you know, following the ball with the zone. And, and, and it was just, it was all these, you know, and he, he said, okay, sometimes I might holler out two, three. You know, what I'm wanting to do right there, and he talked about that and the difference. And he said, you know, and depending on who we're playing, I, I might call for a boxing one, and that means I'm going to ask you, Rustin, or you, whoever, to, you know. And, and I'm like, wow. And so the next day at school, okay, I went to him, and I can remember, I said, Coach, I need you to break it down for me just a little bit. He said, what are you talking about, Rustin? I said, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. I remember what you said, but I need you to show me. And so, you know what? That afternoon, we went on the basketball court, and he placed me. He said, okay, if we're in a 2-1-2, two, two, 
He said, your area of responsibility is from right here to over here, depending on where the ball is. If the ball is on your wing, you're out here. If they, if they rotate that ball, you're coming back, and if they rotate it, you're coming back over here. Now you're in the middle of the key right here, top of the key. But you can't collapse too And he went through and explained. He broke it down for me. In this defense, this is what I need from you. In this defense, this is what I need from you. If we're in man-to-man, I need you to dog whoever it is you're playing. He broke it down for me. After that, I understood it fine. Okay? Sometimes we need things broken down. So when you go through Scripture, uh, there are just some things in there that really break down what it means to be a follower of Christ in terms of how we live our life. Okay? Um, uh, We become a follower of Christ when we profess Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. We profess that in front of a group of people, whether it's on a Sunday morning church or VBS or on a retreat or wherever it might be. Um, We are obedient to be baptized as a follower of Christ, as a symbol of our faith. And that is when our journey with Christ begins. And from that day we accept Christ as our Savior, the rest of our life is is learning about what it means to walk with Jesus and, and to live like Jesus and love like Jesus and all those kind of things. So in Scripture, there are just so many different places. This is not exhaustive at all, but it's just an encouragement, hopefully an encouragement to you. And I'm guessing maybe one of these is going to hit you personally, okay? These are just some of the really um, examples, some real clear examples where Scripture breaks it down for us in terms of this is, this is a part of what it looks like to walk with Christ. This is how you live your life. So I'm going to throw some things out there at you. We're going to look at some scripture. It's not going to be up on the screen. I will give you the reference in case you want to look at it. Okay, so this is the first one, all right? This is the first one. If you're a follower of Christ, okay, this is something that you need to be doing. You need to be thinking of others more than you think of yourself. Or if I can put it another way, you need to live outside the me, me, me box, okay? We, we, are, we live in a culture right now that is a me, me, me culture. It's all about me. And, and, and I'd like to show you me, and that's what social media is all about. And, you know, and I get into this with people all the time, and it's so funny. They'll, I'll say, why, why are you putting so many selfies out there on social media? We haven't forgotten what you look like. Oh, I'm not worried about that. I just want everybody to be able to share in what's happening in my life. And I'm like, no, you're not. You want us to look at where you are and what you're doing. Everything's about me, 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 you know? And I'll look at him, and we'll kind of be going back and forth, back and forth. In, in, um, in some ways, I'm playing devil's advocate. And so at some point, I'll say, okay, how about this? Instead of you putting stuff up there about you, why don't you just post stuff about other people? Uh, why would I do that? Uh, there you go. You just answered the question. If you're going to be a follower of Christ, it means that your life is going to be lived looking at others more than you look at yourself, stepping outside the me, me, me box, okay? One person put it like this. I didn't come up with this, so it's pretty good. They said a follower of Christ needs to have a joy philosophy, a joy philosophy of living life. Jesus, others, yourself, and keep them in that order. Jesus first, others, yourself. The Bible puts it this way in Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, we do have to take care of ourselves, but also for the interests of others. A philosophy of joy. Think of others more than you think of yourself. Step outside of the me, 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 me box, okay? So maybe that's something you need to, to kind of look at. Is that, am I living that way? Is that, is, is my life give evidence to that? Second thing is this, okay? I want to encourage you, you need to laugh. You need to laugh every day. Uh, you need to laugh as often as you can every day. You need to laugh. And I'm not just talking about, you know, th- just a polite laugh. I'm not talking about that southern kind of laugh, like when somebody tells a joke that's not funny and you just kind of go, <laughs> okay, thank you. And, you know, I'm not talking about that kind of laugh. I'm talking about the kind of laugh. Have you ever had the kind of laugh, hopefully, lately, recently, where your eyes teared up? Have you ever had a belly laugh like that? I mean, your eyes just tear, and you can't stop it. Every time you think you've got it under control, you think about what it was that made you start laughing, or you look at what made you start laughing, and it starts up all over again. And a lot of times, that kind of laughter happens in church when you can't let it out. 
Who's ever been trapped in a pew, dying of laughter, and you could not, you were doing everything you could to cover it up, but everybody on the whole pew felt the pew vibrating because you're sitting there laughing. Man, we need to laugh every day, as often as we can. Job 8, 21. He will yet fill your mouth. And these are his friends that are telling him, look, Job, when, when, when God gets done here and, 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 and when, when all this stuff is figured out in your life, he will fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with a shout of joy. Psalm 126, 2. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. And the other nation says, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Laughter is good. The Mayo Clinic says that laughter produces all kinds of good stuff for you in a physiological way. I mean, you can go home and Google it if you think I'm making this up. They say that, that good belly laughing on a regular basis, it releases endorphins into your system, which is a good thing, it relieves stress, can soothe tension, can improve your immune system, relieve pain, improve mood, laugh. Some of us need to laugh more because we've kind of gotten where we're not fun to be around. Laughter just, it's, it's just it's a way of cleansing the heart, cleansing the soul. Now, let me say this, just a little bit of a, um, um, sub, sub piece of wisdom you, you would probably good for you if you would learn to laugh more often at yourself that's a really good thing to learn how to do um, and as far as others go laugh with others you, you kind of want to avoid laughing at others unless they're telling a joke but laugh with others. Enjoy laughter. Um, for the past two, three, four days over at Miss Lunell's house, there's been a gathering of people in and out, in and out, family coming in, all those kind of things. I got to spend some time yesterday morning uh, with uh, one of her daughters, Lita. How many of you remember Lita? Yeah. And, um, and several other people. And right here in the shadow of a sad moment, which was the passing of his father, a happy sad moment. It's happy if you know who Jesus is. That's always a good thing, but it's still sad. But in the middle of that, and I've seen this so many times, in the middle of that, somebody started telling a story. And there was a story about, do you, whenever a story starts out, hey, do you remember that time? 90% of the time, it's going to be a hilarious story when it's over with. And I got to telling stories. And, I, of course, I already knew what I was preaching on. And I, and I just kind of stood there because I was the outsider of this group. They, I had to meet everybody and all this kind of stuff. And so I was just getting to share in their life. And they just started laughing and laughing. And one story led to another. And right there in the middle of the grief of her father's passing was this incredible joy that was evidenced by this beautiful from the heart, laughter, as they were sharing stories about Bob and what he had taught and what he had done with his children. I laughed with them. It's good to laugh. Proverbs 15, 13 says, a glad heart makes a cheerful face. That's some good advice. Maybe some of y'all need to catch on to there, okay? A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of heart, the spirit is crushed. Laugh. Find something to laugh at. Here's the third one I want to throw out. This is a three-part third one, okay? It's all tied together, but um, the same general says, but I just want to throw these out there. Honor God with your tithe, spend less money than you make, and respond anonymously to financial needs of others. That all has to do with how you handle your money. This is a big thing with God. He gives us a lot of instructions about this. And I do a lot of marriage counseling, pre- and post-marriage counseling. And one of the very, very common things that comes up in post-marriage counseling uh, when we're talking about what is it that's causing so much stress or tension in your marriage is it, incredible how often the answer is money, finances. We're too deep in debt. We don't have enough money at the end of the month. We're just, we have all this stuff, but we can't hardly buy food sometimes. And that's because somewhere in there they didn't understand some of what God said about how to handle your money. 
Malachi 3.10, bring all the tithe into the storehouse so there will be food in my temple. And if you do, I'll open the windows of heaven for you. I'll pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to, to, to take it in. Just try it. Put me to the test. That's what God says about honoring him with the tithe. Proverbs 27, beginning verse 23, know well the condition of your flock. Flock is a representation of a person's wealth, what you have, your belongings, and all those kind of things. Know well the condition of your flock, pay attention to your herds, for wealth is not forever. Not even a crown lasts for all time. And then in Matthew 6, beginning of verse 1, watch out, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever give. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Honor God with your time. Spend less than you make. And help people anonymously every chance you get. All right, here's another one. If you're a follower of Christ, this is something that really needs to be just one of the big threads in your life. You need to be the kind of person who chooses encouragement over criticism. You choose to be an encourager rather than be a critic. Now, I'll tell you something. This world we live in right now, guess what? The great majority of people are becoming. Everybody, everybody is quick to tell you what's wrong and what's not right. If you study the Bible and you study the the life of Christ, the footsteps of Christ, we are called not to be critics. Everybody, anybody can talk about what's wrong. We have the answer to how to make things right, and it's Jesus. Be, be an encourager. Choose encouragement over criticism. Let me put it another way. Major in construction rather than demolition. Build up. Don't tear down. Man, some of your marriages would be so, so much better if you would practice this in your marriage. And, I'm not, and that's not, I mean, I'm, I'm being straight up for real. It breaks my heart sometimes when I see how husbands and wives talk to each other and how critical they can be and how they tear each other down in public. And if they're doing it in public, I'm like, oh, I wonder what it's like at home there. Choose to be an encourager at home. Not a demolition man. 1 Thessalonians 5.11. What does the Bible say? What's God say about it? Well, he puts it this way. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you're already doing. Keep doing that. That's what I'm wanting. Be an encourager. Build people up. Okay, here's another thing you need to really make sure you understand and that you, that you uh, practice in your life if you're a follower of Christ. Okay? This is the way I put it. There's probably a better way to put it, but anyway. Prayer, prayer is a knockout punch when you're being harassed by worry. When, when worry jumps on you, do we have any worriers in here that admit it? If you're a worrier person, would you raise your hand? We have one, two, only three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, they're, they're sprouting up everywhere. Yeah. I'm thinking 98% of the mothers in here should have been raising their hands. Just saying. But that's okay. Gail's a little bit more of a worrier than I am. I'm the one that's always saying, Gail, don't worry about it. And she's the one always saying, but I do. Don't worry. And, and when worry starts harassing you, when that creep, and it does, it comes in, it creeps in there, and it's kind of like throws a shadow over your heart and your mind. And then you start thinking about all the worst things that can happen and what if they do happen and you're worrying. And, and prayer is a knockout punch to that kind of stuff because worry is not from God. Worry is an expression of doubt in the ability of God to be at work in your circumstances. Okay, now healthy concern is a good thing. Worry is a crippling thing. And a way to knock worry out is to drop to your knees and pray. Be honest with God. Telling God, I am worrying myself sick over this. Would you free me from it? Would you bring me peace? The Bible says in Philippians 4, 6 and 7, don't worry about anything. Don't. 
But in everything, through prayer, there it is, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Give it to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I'm going to tell you, when that worry, worry monster jumps on you, you need to go straight to your knees, pray. Say, God, I can't do this. I can't live this way. I can't live in this kind of fear. Afraid of what might happen. Worried about this or that or, or what my child might do or what my aging parent, what might happen here or, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Prayer. Prayer is where you go to knock that stuff out. Okay. So moving right along here. Yeah, we're just floating through. Complaining has become an art form in our culture. Oh, great day. But for the follower of Christ, what we need to understand is that when we feel like complaining, we need instead to express thanks. And when we voice our thanks, we find our complaints die away. There's a great old hymn that some of you in here will be very familiar with. As soon as I start these lyrics, you'll know them. Some of you, it might be a new thing to you, but it's, it's in there. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you're discouraged, thinking all is lost. That's from the first verse. And now I'm going to quote from the fourth verse. I'm combining verse four and one. I know you're not supposed to do that, but I'm doing it. I got to do the sermon, so it's on me. Count your many blessings. Angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. How many can hear it in your head right now, that great old hymn? Count your blessings. Yeah. You see, see what happens when, when complaining starts to kind of come in that, that, that old complaining spirit in our heart, it, it, it's like it puts blinders on us. And it, it's like we almost forget every blessing and good thing God has done for us. And so God tells us his word, look, you need to focus on who I am and all that I've done. And the more we do that, our blinders come off and we realize in spite of where we are right now, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And I'm going to trust him in this. There's a story of Paul and Silas, and, you know, they got in trouble. They got arrested for doing, like, ministry in Jesus' name. Not only did they get arrested, um, they got beaten, and then they got put in jail. In Acts 16.23 is right in the middle of that whole story. After they had inflicted many blows on them, Paul and Silas, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to keep them securely guarded and receiving such an order, he put them in the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks. They're chained in prison. Now, me, this is a good time to complain. Complain about how I'm being treated. Complain about, God, where are you? God, I was out there preaching in your name, and this is what I get for it. And the Bible tells us that these two guys, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. Praying and singing hymns. And the prisoners were listening to them. The prisoners were watching to see how the Christians were going to handle this. And what were the Christians doing? Complaining? No. They were praising God. They were counting their blessings. They were letting their joy overflow. Gratitude. Gratitude may not change your situation, but listen to me. Gratitude will change how the situation feels. It will. And then here's the last one, okay? These are just threads of the Christian life. These are things that need to be a part of how we're living our life if, we're, if, we, if we claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And the last one goes like this. Keep going, even if you feel like quitting. Keep going. Sometimes, sometimes you will have seasons in life when all you can focus on is one more step. Take one more step. If that's all you can focus on, take that one step. Trust what God's doing. 
Uh, one of the things you hear a lot of times in, um, well, uh, in, in, in business and whatnot, I hear it a lot uh, in, uh, from coaches and in coaches' interviews, and they talk about the team and where the team was and where they've come from. And one of the things you hear a lot is, is that the coaches say, you know, I kept telling the players, trust the process, trust the process, trust the process. This is what we're doing. This is what we're working on. This is how we're focusing on it. Trust the process. And the results may not be immediate, but trust the process. And so now two years later, look, we're playing for this championship or we're playing in this um, series of significance. And the process has brought us here. Trust the process. Sometimes you're going to have moments, days, seasons, where it's like, I don't know if I can go anymore. I, don't, I, just, I, I, God, I just don't know. Don't quit. One step. Just take one more step. In Matthew 6, what did Jesus say? Don't worry about tomorrow now. Don't worry about tomorrow. Because what's going to happen tomorrow? Yeah, it's going to have enough for you to deal with when you get there. But today, one more step. In Romans 12, 1, Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight, the sin that so easily ensnares us, and run with endurance the race that lies before us. For several years, I haven't done it in the last couple of years, but for a lot of years, I would go up to Atlanta every year and run the, the uh, Peachtree Road Race, 10K race. And some years, I was in good shape to do it. And then other years, I wasn't in good shape to do it, good running shape. And, and so there were times in those years when I w- was not in great running shape. Uh, it's usually about mile three and a half to four to four and a half. When I seriously was having a conversation with myself that it was okay to just step off. See, because it's right, you can just step off on the sidewalk and you're done. You can just step off, blend in with people, and they'd never know you you were a quitter. <laughs> you know, you could just kind of step off, get two or three deep, and then start clapping. Come on, keep going, keep going, because that's what they're doing. There are all these people along the line. Keep going. You can do it. You can do it. And you're running along there going, oh, my gosh, I'm about to puke. I can't do this. It'd be so easy. And it's at those kind of points where you have to say, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just, I'm just going to take the next step. And, and they're going to have to scrape me off this asphalt to get me out of this race. And I finished it every year. I started. I finished it. I didn't finish it well every year, but I finished it. 2 Thessalonians 3.13, brothers, let me add sisters to that, followers of Christ. Do not grow weary in doing good. You know, sometimes that person you've been witnessing to for years, and it's like, why won't they listen? Don't quit. Tell them one more time about how much Jesus loves them. That neighbor, that friend, that coworker you've been inviting to come to church, and every time you invite, they have something already scheduled. Do you ever know that person? Don't grow weary. Don't quit. Keep inviting. That child who's kind of pulling the prodigal right now, and you're so frustrated, don't quit praying for them. Don't quit loving them. And don't quit letting them know you love them. That person who's so angry toward you, vengeful toward you, whatever it may be, and you've tried to love them, You've tried to love them. Don't stop loving them. Don't quit. Just keep on. Whatever it is. You've been teaching Sunday school for 32 years, and you still don't feel like they're listening? Keep on. Keep on, Cookie. I mean, keep on. (laughs) I'd say that because she's right there. She's a great Sunday school teacher. Keep on. So there you go. I just tried to break it down. Not on my own, but... There's so many ways in Scripture that it's already broken down for us. Sometimes we just have to highlight them a little bit. And like I said, I'm guessing one of those areas is, is one that maybe you need to work on a little bit. I need to work on. Uh, but all to the glory of God so that our life is testimony to the grace of God. Let's stand together, okay? Listen, it's good to have you here today. Be in prayer for Wednesday night. Uh, FCA outreach event. If you've volunteered something, have it here by Tuesday at 4 o'clock. Uh, Wednesday morning, 8 o'clock, if you can help out. Wednesday night, our men will be here. If you want to come afterwards to help with some cleanup, ladies, come on back for that. 
cookies, bake them. No matter what kind, right? Good kind. Good kind, which means a lot of butter and a lot of sugar. Anything else you put in there, that'll be fine. God bless you. I want to have a closing prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you today. Thank you for calling us to yourself in Jesus Christ. And Father, thank you that you're so patient with us. We're, 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 we're all a little bit slow sometimes in learning how to really walk in the steps of Christ. And, and, and we're stubborn. Sometimes it's, it's, it's just that we're stubborn. We don't want to learn a new way or a different way. But Father, teach us more and more every day in how we live life, how we love people, how we react to life. Father, show us, teach us how to do that in a way that honors you and that really lets people know that, that we love Jesus. Bless every home represented in this room, those who are watching online. Uh, keep our Ugandan team safe as they come home, our students safe until they get home tomorrow. And Father, bless all that's going on um, here in our community. Help us to be light and salt. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Amen.